Hello, I'm Jan Seal Roberts. I'm Publishing Director of Aegis Journals, uh, published by Springer Healthcare. Springer Healthcare is part of Springer Nature, a very reputable publishing company. And uh, I believe we are these days the largest open access publisher in the world. And open access publishing has grown considerably over the last few years, mostly predicated on the, the gold author pays open access model. But this model has actually been um, subject to exploitation by less reputable publishers. So my talk today is on the perils and pitfalls of predatory publishers. A reminder to us all. So predatory publishers, what are they? Well, Geoffrey Beale, we'll be going to be talking about him in a moment, has uh, given us the definition of those who unprofessionally exploit the author pays model of open access publishing for their own profit. And effectively, these, these companies are in the business of uh, attracting the APCs, the article processing charges and other revenues, primarily under false pretenses, either by pretending to be what they are actually not or pretending to be better than they really are. And these really are the bad guys of publishing. So how to recognise a predatory publisher? Well, it's actually very hard and these guys are getting sneakier and sneakier and it, it's getting harder. So, for example, these companies can often appear to have an editorial office somewhere that, that sounds quite credible. A lot of them seem to have offices on, on the west coast of the US. But on closer consideration, you realise that these are often false fronts. And many of these companies seem to have been set up uh, in Asia or, or in India. And they'll often be operating under a name that sounds credible and, and often very familiar, but, but not quite the same. And if you look at the website, and often you need to look very carefully, you'll find that there aren't any clear contact names, or, or there may be or one or two, but uh, the more you look, you see the same names popping up, and sometimes the same companies behind these names. And if there are email addresses provided, they often are without domain names, so they're unprofessional, often they're Google or, or Hotmail addresses. And when you look at the website, you may think, well, this all looks quite familiar. But, but then when you look a little closer, the, the pictures can look fuzzy or, or there are inconsistencies. The editorial board pictures don't look as though they've been professionally done or, or, or the pictures look as though they may have been lifted from somewhere else, as often they have been. And also, when you look, you'll be thinking, wow, this, this looks amazing, PubMed indexed and amazing impact factors. But if you actually go and look on Thomson Reuters or, or check PubMed, you'll see these journals aren't actually there. And you may think, wow, these, these are offering great things. Look at these fast uh, timelines or, or these amazingly cheap options. Mm. Often there are hidden costs and uh, sometimes the, the claims are false. And perhaps importantly, most importantly, but, but people don't often think about this, there'll be a lack of policy about uh, digital preservation. And when you think about this, if these are fly-by-night companies and they go down, what's going to happen to their, their digital legacy, and more importantly, papers that, that you may have submitted to them. So it's very, often very hard, but look closely, and uh, often you, you, will, you will discover that these people are, are not all that they claim to be. So what's the big deal? These, these are just people exploiting the market, surely. But the fact is, these, these companies are often sneaky, and ultimately they are in the business of being out to defraud. And it's my experience that, that researchers are often shocked when they first encounter these people. They're aware that there are different companies trying to exploit the open access market, but actually when they begin to realise what's, what's implied, it, it can be quite shocking. And there are more and more companies out there who are operating as predatory publishers. And a, a few years ago, it was very obvious. You know, these, these websites looked so dodgy, and, and it was clear that these were not what they appeared to be. But in recent years, these folk really have upped their game. And often, they appear credible and do take the unaware by surprise. So how do they work? Well, they tend to recruit interest by widespread emailing. So many people will get invitations. They'll be uh, often flattering interest in their research and offering really uh, attractive publishing options. Often it's really quick, it's really fast. L look how amazing we are. And it can be quite flattering to be, to be invited to submit. And when you look on their website, it looks as though they're, they're, they're very familiar and often their names are familiar. And sometimes they have identical names to established journals. This is called hijacking, where an established journal is hijacked by, by one of these companies. 
And as I said earlier, the websites often look authentic at first glance. And you may say, wow, well, the font looks like just like a journal I recognise, and the logo looks very similar to one that I know. And, uh, well, the text reads beautifully. I mean, it all looks perfect English. And often it is because it may have been lifted um, from, from other uh, authentic websites. But when you look more closely, it's clear that these companies do lack transparency. Usually, they will have a very low article acceptance threshold despite their claims. They may say they've got a great impact factor, but you'll find that they accept just about everything. Sometimes it really is everything. And one of our major griefs is that they actually offer very little to scholarship and instead actually allow pseudoscience to masquerade as real science. And that's one of the big dangers. And ultimately, their business models usually are unsustainable. In many instances, they take the money and they run. So from the author point of view, the problem is that they're often duped into thinking that they are going to be submitting to a reputable journal. And as I said earlier, they may be flattered by an invitation to submit or beguiled by the attractive terms. But usually, they're misled by the false reputation being offered. And some companies will actually pocket the article processing charge and do not publish. Others will publish, but often there'll be hidden charges, surprise invoices that follow. There's generally a lack of transparency with these companies. But now, one of the real compromising things is that the author will now be inexorably linked to this particular journal. And the citation of this author may be used by, by the journal in question or the publisher in question in subsequent marketing campaigns. Suddenly, this, this author is linked to this company. And that can lead to, to tarnished reputation in the eyes of the wise. And ultimately, when these people are up against uh, recruitment uh, committees, etc., they can be accused of poor judgment. But as I mentioned earlier, there's also the big additional risk of the digital repository not being maintained. And then what happens to that data? So you publish data in a fly-by-night journal, primary publication, and suddenly it's no longer there. And I've had people coming up to me saying, well, what do I do? My data has been published, but, but it's not published anymore. Can we submit it to you guys? And, and we'll say, well, sorry, that was the primary publication. You haven't got a citation now. You're going to have to think more laterally. So please, please, we would say to you guys, beware of these, these people and, and do warn your authors uh, and KORs about the risks um, of this lack of, of digital maintenance. And also, these, these companies often will have no checks run for plagiarism protection. So not only is everybody vulnerable in having their own material plagiarised, but often they're in the business of, of plagiarising other people's work. And there are lots of examples in the press of, of uh, these companies who are clearly just keen to, to publish pocket the APC and, and get it out there. Uh, apologies for the language, but this is probably my favourite example. It was uh, in the public domain um, just a couple of years ago. Um, this guy, Stephen Luntz, was so hacked off with being approached time and time and time and time and time again by a particular company saying, send us your best data, send us, send us anything, just, just send us something. And eventually he penned a, a, a seven-word phrase over and over and over and over and over and over again and, and submitted it, thinking, well, that'll get me off, uh, off their backs or them off my backs. And uh, he assumed that he'd get a, a polite email back or at least somebody would pick it up at, at review stage and have a good laugh and, um, or, or at the very least somebody would pick it up at, at production level before it went up online. But no, it was published just like this. I never did find out whether he paid an APC, but that's another thing altogether. So it's not just authors, but, but reviewers can, who can be misled. So you're asked to review a paper. Um, and initially you think, wow, I, I'm beginning to be somebody. Somebody recognises that although I'm quite junior, I've, I've got potential. But these people will then review the paper in good faith, and maybe for some papers they will review it really carefully, but decide in, in good faith that it's, it's substandard and reject it, only to see that the, publish, the paper's been published anyway. So it leads these reviewers to a sense of wasted time and, by association, damaged reputation. And believe me, once you're on these people's databases, it's hard to get off. And <clears throat> KOLs are often misrepresented. Um, predatory publishers will often blanket email societies um, uh, with invitations to, to KOLs and rising stars to join their editorial board. And people think, great, this is a quick win. I can, I can put this on my CV. I'm the editor of the, the almost journal of something or other. But once they do agree, 
they, they suddenly think, my goodness me, uh, uh, others may say, what, are you crazy? And they then write to say, please take me off your, your board, only to find that their names are, are up there anyway. It's very difficult to get your names taken off when you have agreed. But not only that, uh, KOLs have told me that their names that they've discovered have been included on journal boards without any invitation being issued, let alone accepted. And that although they've written and written to ask for their names to be removed, they haven't been removed without recourse to the threat of legal action. These guys really are persistent and they don't easily take no for an answer. So I'd say to you as MedComs people, might some of your rising stars be flattered by this sort of approach? Well, again, here's an example. It's the Journal of HIV AIDS. Um, uh, it, and you can see these are the sort of um, invitations that go out, greetings from the Journal of HIV AIDS. Uh, we're always striving to involve eminent personalities like yourself uh, and, and your, your standing in the global community makes us confidence, confident. So, so please send the particulars. And, and suddenly you're looking, your name is up there already. And from a personal point of view, many open access publishers like ourselves can end up feeling that we are tarred by the same brush. You're an open access publisher. Doesn't that make you a, a predatory publisher? No. So what's being done about this? Well, in the art of self-defense, most of the major publishers are doing their best to actually address these issues. Our legal teams are, are fighting these one at a time to protect our own reputations uh, and those of our journals and the societies that we represent. But it really is true that the, as fast as one goes down, others uh, emerge to take their place. And we are truly in the business of education. I was at a conference not that long ago where somebody came up to me, a farmer person saying, I've just discovered about predatory publishers. It's really given us a sting. Why didn't we know about this? He was an established guy, but somehow the word hadn't got out until he'd actually been, been bitten by it himself. So we really are on a bit of a mission at the moment to do all that we can to educate others about the risks and the practices. But it's true to say that many very experienced people are not recognizing the dangers until they do encounter these people firsthand. But somebody I want to give a shout to, and, and, and somebody who's done an awful lot in this area over the last few years, is a guy called Jeffrey Beale. Um, he's a, a, an academic librarian in Denver, based at the University of Colorado. And he's really done a huge amount to raise the, the issues surrounding predatory publishing in, in recent years. Uh, he has a prominent online forum called Scholarly Open Access. And he also has a blog that uh, you, can, you can actually write to him directly to ask about issues, uh, specific journal titles, practices, and uh, issues that, that you, you've encountered to actually get his advice and, uh, uh, and, and maybe the advice of others as to, as to how to proceed. This is his, his, uh, his brief, his newsletter, which is called Scholarly Open Access. It really is a, a terrific read and very, very interesting. So here's this week's, um, as you'll see, he's his drawing people's attention to a publication called Innovate, Innovating New and Better World. Striving to bring innovation in research world and implementing changes. And uh, so this is one that it's, it's, it's bringing to people's mind. Look, it's a bizarre new open access publisher that launched recently with 10 broad scoped open access journals. Now, as a publisher myself, I can certainly say that very few companies would be ambitious enough to launch 10 journals uh, all at once. So that would be a warning before you actually start looking in depth about the website. But look, here's the editorial office, theoretically based in Virginia. I don't think so. But Jeffrey Beale, over the past six years, has developed what is known in the industry as a Beale's list, although these days it's actually two lists. Uh, the first you'll see at the top uh, includes publishers that he considers questionable. And since he started this list in 2011, when there were 18 dodgy-looking publishers, this has now grown to 900-odd. Uh, it's quite phenomenal, and the rate of growth is, is quite alarming. And the list below uh, it, it includes the individual journals that don't seem to be published under the, the auspices of any particular publisher. So uh, essentially independent, uh, which he considers to be questionable. And as you can see, since 19, so 2013, it's gone from 126 up to 882. It's quite phenomenal how this list is growing. This practice is, is getting more and more concerning as they up their game. And in addition to those lists, um, from over the last couple of years, uh, Jeffrey Beale has also started two additional lists. Um, first of all, those with misleading metrics. So those that 
formulate and publish counterfeit impact factors or some similar measure. So these are people who are totally fraudulently um, giving impact factors that, to mislead. So last year when he first started there were 26, now there seem to be 38 on his list. And uh, the, the second uh, uh, new list here are hijacked journals. These are not journals with, with similar names to other journals. These are journals that have been started under the auspices of existing journal names, where he has hijacked the identity, where they have hijacked the identity of an established journal. So last year there were 30, now there are 101. It's really quite scary. And if you do look on uh, Jeffrey Beale's blog, you'll see that there's some really interesting exchanges. And um, it really is very practical advice that he gives. So here's one, uh, Sarah in February. She was saying, Mr. Beale, what can be done when a predatory journal is using your name and institution for calls for papers without permission? We've asked them again and again. We've threatened legal response, but no discontinued use. And Jeffrey says, follow through with legal action. It's no good threatening. Email all the members of the editorial board and alert them to what's going on, suggesting they, did, they resign. So it really is practical advice that he offers. Here's another one. What about this publisher? Cytex, they've been spamming me with requests to join their editorial boards. Are they the same as one of the other Cytex publishers? So Jeffrey goes in to say, I haven't heard of them before. Thanks for alerting me. I've analysed it, added to my list, because here we are. It launched with 15 broad medical journals, pretends to be based in Delaware. And the whole idea of something launching so quickly, uh, based in Delaware, but, but it not. So he advises, don't submit their editorial board invitation, and please don't submit any papers. It's a very practical advice that Geoffrey Beale um, provides. And his major recommendations are that researchers, scientists and academics avoid doing any business with these companies and that researchers avoid sending any article submissions or being involved in the editorial boards or even reviewing papers for them or even advertising in them. And he goes on to say tenure and promotion committees should give extra scrutiny to articles published in these journals because many of them include instances of author misconduct. So goodness me, it, it's true, but look how uh, uh, the unaware are at risk of being uh, tarred by that brush. So a quick checklist. How can we tell uh, that a, a publishing outfit or, or a journal is legitimate? So have a look. Make sure that it really is an established publisher or, or society. And we always suggest that people check that there is a professional and, and real courteous interface and also staff that you can co uh, communicate with directly, either by email or even by telephone. We recommend that you check that the instructions to authors are accessible and, and that they're clear and that there is evidence that submissions are checked for plagiarism. So important these days. Um, you need to be sure that there's an electronic submission and tracking system and that the company has a good reputation for proper and good referees being used, and that there's a clear and timely procedure for decision-making and publication, that the content really is indexed, and that the publication fees are clearly displayed, that everything is transparent, there are no hidden or, or surprise costs. And if in doubt, check the Directory of Open Access Journals, doag.org. Uh, so, some take-home messages. I would say first and foremost, make sure that all your staff and your clients are informed and well aware of the existence of predatory publishers. And if you don't think of anything else, be aware of the dangers of lost, danger, of lost data as well as damaged reputations. But it is clear to see that predatory publishers are getting harder to spot. But if a website looks dodgy, it really probably is. And if you're looking at a website, don't be beguiled by seeing editorial board names that you recognise. As I said earlier, it really means nothing these days. But if you look and see that they're blurred pictures or, 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 or things that are presented in inconsistent style, it's an indicator that maybe these people's names and, and photographs have been hijacked. But if you aren't sure about a journal, just go and check out Beale's list. And do keep checking this list. It is updated continually. And as you can see, it, it continues to grow rapidly. And, and finally, the next big thing seems to be bogus conferences, either ones that are falsely accredited or, or total scams. It, it seems that wherever there is money, there are people uh, prepared to exploit and, and take advantage of, of the unaware. So finally, stay alert and make sure that your clients stay alert too. Many thanks.